know, any, 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 any fresh, um, you know, thought leadership in that particular space that you guys are seeing, um, I'd love to, love to hear your thoughts. So Michael, we do this quite a bit. Uh, so we spend a lot of time in DC at think tanks, uh, leading like technology and, and thinking out of the box, um, to be able to handle this, this incoming, uh, manufacturing load in the U.S. as an example, plus the renewables, I have to grow the, the grid 3.2 times than it currently mm -hmm. is. So that equals about $5.8 coming into play. And so that is uh, gives you the magnitude and size in dollars. What's my alternative? Uh, the uh, We like uh microgrids because if i'm going to spend on infrastructure and there's there's a huge pushback on states when you're crossing territories at least in u.s with FERC, if i'm doing a bunch of power lines across a country across a state that gets no benefit but they have to pay their shot share per mile well the ag's office the attorney general's office is going to sue FERC to stop it right because it adds a financial burden to the, the rate payer who gets no benefit. Now, that's because of the national grid, except for Texas. Texas is not connected to the national grid. So what do we do? Well, if, we're, if we want to do these items of interest, then look at uh, microgrids. And we like micro turbines, what uh, Toshiba has, uh, what uh, uh, New Power has. Uh, which has the regulatory approval for a 77 megawatt nuclear power plant, right? So we have the technology. So that way we can power locally, you know, your local city, your, your, your town, what have you, uh, which gives us energy security, reliability, uh, without having the enormous amount of cost where not everybody benefits. Uh, from that cost. So that's one part. Uh, Relative to agriculture that Sean brought up, which is right, uh, we are looking at uh, farms, and these are thousand acre farms on up that are sustainable, that proven sustainable. So they typically have a, we want to see somebody has a, a run for at least five years and look at their data. It's like maybe three or four farms that have that same sustainability concept. The challenge is, is scaling. So you're right, the, uh, what Michael mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of uh, industrial scale, uh, cattle, chickens, fish. Yeah, okay, well, how do we do that sustainable way to keep the health of a human up? Uh, and we look at products that have high density food. Uh, on the plant side, the density of nutrition is extremely low and the human body doesn't react very well to that. So both in cognitive thinking, and it's a huge delta between high protein density food versus not, right? And I need everybody to think, I need brain power, right? We need our young people to have brain power. So uh, we want our cake and eat it too. And we shoot high. And so when we look at these three or four farms, we says, you know, we go to a thousand acres to 50,000 acres. Is it workable? How do we make it workable using technology, what have you, and help these, uh, these farmers, these ranchers that are doing these uh, uh, concepts? And their margins have dropped dramatically. Uh, you know, going from 30% to 12% margin on average. Right. So you're really, really threading a needle and can you survive a bad year? Right. So we bring on the house on, on technology to say, yeah, here's how we can do to help the margin, uh, help the marketing. Uh, and how do you scale? How do you get the next thousand acres? And by the way, it's very, very difficult. I'll just do one quick piggyback and then I don't know if you want to head over to. Um culture jesse but i think the point you made around regulation is really massive right we have this the way that both deregulated and regulated markets work right now is you know i don't think that the price of energy is really normalized for that cost of transmission so we're you know the idea of sort of um 
distributed energy resources and power generation, you know, closer to point of use is, is penalized right now. So everything from our, you know, net metering and interconnection fees, um, we're, 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 we're kind of penalizing having uh, power, like these, you know, small and distributed energy resources generating power at, at, at point of use. And it's exacerbating, I think, the transmission uh, considerations. Um, so obviously power is like <laughs> incredibly complex uh, in terms of the way it's regulated from generation to transmission to, to user. I would, so I think your point around the importance of regulation and being able to, you know, actually um, bake in the, the price and the value of these distributed energy resources, not necessarily like taking up capacity and transmission is something that is a failure in the regulatory regime right now, in my opinion. Great. Um, yeah, I'll jump in, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of the grid, I agree distributed are one of our uh, biggest uh, thesis is on distributed power generation. Uh, you know, there's there's no way we're going to triple the world's grid in the next couple of decades. Right. Like, let, let's just be honest. That is not going to happen. Um, it needs to happen, but it's not going to, which means that we have to go and we will go to distributed uh, energy. And, uh, you know, one of our one of the things that we're working on right now is is uh, new technology in long duration energy storage, and that is, um, I think, you know, going to be a, an explosive industry, an explosive area of technology development and commercialization over the next decade. I think we, um, I, I think it's going to kind of be the Calvary coming to the rescue, to be honest, because if we don't have significant answers with with long duration energy storage, where we're going to have a big problem with, with the grid. I mean, that's all there is to it. So uh, if you look at where the pressure has to be relieved, I think it's, it's distributed energy. I think um, long duration storage is the technology is evolving very rapidly. I think it will continue to do so. And I think it's going to be a, a very big uh, focus for us, but, but also a lot of investment in the next decade. Yeah. And, and do you think the regulations and, and, and the, you know, sort of supports that? Paul, because I agree. I agree with everything you just said, right? I mean, it definitely points to that intersection. But then, you know, as far as regulation funding, um, does that even align with that um, on a global, on a global or even national scale, if you just yeah. consider the US, right? Yeah, no, I mean, look, obviously, I, I, you know, we can't talk about, you know, every little bit of legislation because it would take, it'd take forever. There's clearly there's issues. But I think I think uh, where there's pain points, as pain points evolve, I think the legislation will evolve, but only after you know a lot of pain has kind of created the need to change some of the legislation that that right now is not ideal. Uh, but I think it will change because we're going to have we're going to have problems, right? We're going to have grid problems. We've already seen a lot of grid problems in California, Texas. Um, and we're going to continue to have those kinds of issues. And so legislation will follow, I think, after a problem or after a pain point. But I think it will follow uh, because it has to. I mean, I don't I don't know. I'm not the world's smartest guy here, but I just don't see how we do it any other way. Uh, and so I think legislation will be latent, but I think it will follow at some point because we don't have a lot of good options. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the the key element relative to the U.S. grid uh, was Beacon Power. Since you're an energy storage space, that might ring a bell. Good friends of mm -hmm. mine, no longer in existence, but they spent an enormous amount of VC capital strictly on FERC regulation to have storage recognized as an asset. And the next biggest play was Texas, uh, was 2011. Uh, which uh, that came to play and approved. Uh, it's kind of like a mini country, the way ERCOC works and the Texas PUC. Uh, I do see energy storage. Uh, if we have to connect, how do we reduce the cost? There's two elements in play. Uh, we did a huge program with Encore. Encore is one of the bigger uh, wire people uh, in play. Uh, if I've had storage at endpoint, of the load, does that reduce my wire size, my wire cost, and increase the utilization thereof? The answer is yes, substantially. 
The other part is just for FYI for this group is when we design a grid, we design it for just 100 hours of the year. There's 8,600 hours in a year. 100 hours is when it peaks. And you can see in transmission wires, you can see it droop 10 or 15 feet for those large transmission towers. You can see the wire drooping because of the heat. But that's only for 100 hours of the year. So they over-design it tremendously. So you got 10x cost to handle that 100 hours. Energy storage reduces that burden because the load is already there. You place it when the, the night is cool. So, and it, it works. We, we, we've done it already with a gigawatt on a stress transmission to see if we can melt the wire and blow it up, which is always fun. Uh, but it works at scale when we talk about multi-gigawatt. So yes, uh, to Paul's point, there is a venue to, uh, I don't want 3.5X in transmission. What do I do when I have a U.S. population heading towards 425 million people? So there is an adverse incentive that the utilities have, especially the um, private utilities, to increase their asset size uh, or the spend on assets because a percentage of that is something that they can generate as a profit. So I've seen, I did a project for uh, Smart Grid and I've seen that those guys prefer heavy investments uh, because that generates more profit for them, even if the solution is not optimal. Uh, I mean, I, I think the transmission may have a similar issue. Yes, you're designing mm -hmm. it for the worst 100 hours, but to invest in battery technology that would reduce those assets is, is kind of uh, telling them that, oh, you cannot make as much profit. Do you understand? There, there is like a- Yeah, so uh, just so everybody knows. There. Yeah, good, good point. And a utility typically going to make 10% profit. If they make 20% profit in a quarter, the next quarter they have to give that back to the rate payer. So can you well imagine that you're a company, a Google or a Facebook, and the most profit you can ever make is 10%, right? Mm -hmm. And the deal is, because utilities are basically a socialist type program to help the, the working poor and the privileged, right? So, but everybody gets to play, everybody gets connected, all right? Because now I have rights to your meter, that's all, the funding side of the house wants to know and agreed upon, right? That's why our rates are very, very low. So if we put a carbon tax on it, then it's a pass-through cost eventually. And who do we harm? You're not gonna, it's, it's not, uh, is it gonna be equal to their usage? Like from, let's say a fab, a fab is about 200 megawatt load, semiconductor fab. Uh, Versus grandma in her small home who pays 125 bucks a month and that's all she can afford. And here's your carbon tax as well. Regardless of what we do at the policy, cell, it always harms the least advantage mm -hmm. every single time. Um, Jesse, you... We, we're just we're we're talking about some really interesting stuff and we're talking about a lot of different things. But if you wanted to uh, to redirect the conversation on the point of today's <laughs> podcast, maybe you should do that. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I I uh, I, I quite enjoy uh, this uh, like a developer of the topics. I I found it's interesting that the greed topic is actually the last meeting in last year. And but people in this meeting keep coming back to the Greek topic. I feel that's a very high priority topic. And, and but of course, agriculture is a very important topic too. And I I plan to have a topic for each meeting, but maybe uh, there uh, there will be some different development. But that, that that's interesting too. And uh, um, for different like uh, areas, I see that's uh, like uh, <clears throat> every time I see a new deal, I I see there's a whole unknown space 
like as a whole landscape that we might don't know what we don't know. So for example, for this food and agriculture, uh, I invited uh, Tom to join us because he has a very long year experience in, in this and um, their farms uh, have over 110 uh, companies in the portfolio. So maybe from this vintage, he can give us a, a, a better a top view. And so um, I think they they have um, different funds and, and different business model and different thesis. So how about this um, have time to introduce him and, and their LPs and their business model and their thesis and start from there we can have a Q and A chat. Thank you, time. Yeah, thank you, Jesse. And thanks everyone for the time, especially on a Friday. Appreciate it. Um, snowing here in the Northeast. I don't know where everybody else is, but uh, winter has finally ar arrived. Um, so great to meet you all today. My name is Tom Ashboni. I'm the Chief Investment Officer here at Big Idea Ventures. We are a global investment firm managing, as Jesse said, a couple different funds, uh, focused on different fund strategies. I came to the firm uh, three and a half years ago uh, after working at Tyson Foods for about three years, uh, launching and running their corporate venture capital group. It was the first CVC group for Tyson. Um, we had a $150 million mandate from the company to invest across both enabling technologies, but also disruptive technologies, uh, which led us to investments not only in things like rapid pathogen detection and direct to consumer platforms, but in alternative proteins um, as well, both on the plant-based side and on the cultivated or cell-based side. Um, prior to Tyson, spent my career in private equity, venture capital, a variety of areas of stages and growth. Um, started my career in public accounting. Um, I'm based out of our New York office, but the firm has offices in New York, Singapore, and Paris. Uh, and as I said, we have a couple of different fund strategies that we manage for our investors. Um, the first strategy is alternative protein focused exclusively. So we invest in plant-based, cultivated or cell-based and fermentation-based meat, dairy and seafood products and their enabling technologies. I invested in that first fund when I was at Tyson Foods. We saw it as a great workforce multiplier for us, a way to widen our aperture globally, see what was coming at us uh, earlier uh, and participate meaningfully as an investor in that fund. Um, when I left Tyson, I approached Andrew Ive, the founder of Big Idea Ventures, and said, look, I'm leaving Tyson. You should know that. Uh, and I have some ideas for a fund I'd like to spin up. Love to get your thoughts. Uh, and Andrew said, well, don't do that. Come work here uh, as my CIO overseeing my global investment operations and spin up whatever funds you like. Um, so so here is, is where I've been since then. Um, as Jesse said, New Protein Fund 1 has over 100 investments pretty evenly spread across plant-based, cultivated, and fermentation-based meat, dairy, and seafood products and technologies. Um, we run an accelerator program on that fund platform. So both fund one and fund two have an accelerator uh, built into that fund structure. And it gives us a really great way to do deep due diligence on companies. Whereas in a typical VC model, you'll spend about two or three months diligencing a company uh, and end up writing two or $3 million checks for uh, for roughly 5 to 12% ownership in a company, we invest in a much earlier stage. We take a more meaningful stake, around 8% for $200,000. But the accelerator gives us a way to spend about 800 hours with these companies, really understanding which ones at follow-on we want to write significant checks into. Um, Fund One started in 2018. It's fully deployed, um, and we're in the process of harvesting some investments there, waiting for the market to turn a little bit back in our favor. Uh, and then on uh, on the on the new protein fund two side, that fund just had a, held its first close in May. We ran the first accelerator cohort there, and we're lining up the second close for the next call forty five to sixty days uh, or so. Mainly uh, corporate investors in new protein fund one and new protein fund two. Stakeholders from across the protein industry, um, whether you're talking about uh, Bueller on the OEM side, Givadon on the ingredient side, or Tyson on the processing and, and consumer side, uh, but companies as well as Bell Group from France, Meiji in Japan, AAK from Sweden, which is a fats and oils ingredients provider. 
Um, they very much use that fund, same way we did at Tyson, uh, to find interesting companies to work with, potential customers of their supply chain, uh, or potential acquisitions for them. I think maybe I'll stop there quickly before I talk about the other strategy, because it is very different, uh, and see if anyone has any questions. I'm very interested on the protein side, uh, your thoughts about the comparable to what they do for uh, on meat products and what you're seeing on the health side, the the nutrition density side. Um, yep. Are you able to add a little more color to that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question. Um, so I, I, full transparency, I am not a vegan. I am not plant-based. I am an omnivore. Um, my vegetables, though, tend to be sides and salads. They tend not to be center of plate for myself. So I have a, a discerning protein palate, we'll say. Um, that said, I think that makes me a pretty good judge of these products because I know what they're aiming for. And I have a good sense of if you are trying to do what Ethan and the Beyond team were trying to do, which is attack the carnivore market, which is much larger than the vegan vegetarian market and convert some of those people to, to be more reductitarian and reduce the amount of red meat uh, and white meat products that they're intaking, then you have to develop products that meet or beat taste expectations, right? We, we in the US, we buy food for two reasons, price and taste, primarily. Uh, Europeans are much more sustainably focused when they make purchasing decisions. In the US, price and taste rule the day. So if you can't make a product that tastes as good or better and costs as much or less, you're gonna have a really hard time getting people to move consistently. And that's what we're seeing in the market right now. We've seen an acceleration of consumer adoption, but a lack of, of loyalty. And now you, you, we saw it plateau and now you're seeing it to start to come down again. Um, so um, let me ask that, because you said the marketing thing, if you don't I'm, uh, apologize from, from jumping in there. Um, you said the the market, uh being attracted to the project and what are you seeing is is this do you have trends in either china india or some other large populated areas <clears throat> yeah um india is a is a tough market because they have been plant-based probably the longest of anyone on the planet um so it's quite difficult to introduce meat analogs there meaning plant-based products are trying to imitate animal meat and, and the, the cow is considered sacred, obviously, by the majority of, of Indians. So that category is just completely off limits. You can't even sell a Beyond Burger that looks like a regular hamburger for cultural reasons. Um, and we want to obviously respect those. Now, you can go and sell sausage all day long uh, in India, and they eat a lot of that as well as chicken. Um, so, so those markets are tougher to get into. China is a different reason why it's a tough market to get into. One, we don't have a lot of transparency. We don't operate in China. Um, we don't have a presence in country. We've had one or two investments there and one recently left and relocated out of China. Um, the Chinese culture is a little bit different. Whereas when you, in China, when you move from sort of a lower economic class to the middle class, meat enters your diet on a regular basis. And that is your way of signifying to your community that we have moved in terms of the economic strata, that's a really hard thing to change, to go into and say, well, don't buy this product, buy that product um, instead, because culture that's ingrained that, you know, we've now made it to a certain level and we're gonna buy more animal meat um, for our diet. So that coupled with ingredients and biosecurity around ingredients and manufacturing capacity, food safety, all combined to make it a difficult market, um, at least for us as a firm to operate in. Sorry, I don't have more color on China for you. No, it's good. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Um, and, and just going back, I wanted to get back to your question around nutrition density uh, and probably bioavailability of, of nutritionals. Um, I, I personally am not, I'm the son of a biology professor, so I like data. Um, I like empirical data and research. And for my, um, for my dollar, there's not enough research done around how healthy these products are actually are for you, right? Um, certainly it, it, reducing meat from being your only protein source to being a sometimes protein source, and this is very similar to economics. Oh, yeah. you, know, you talk to economists, they'll tell you that the best model for, for sta stable economic growth is borrowing a little bit from each different model, everything in moderation. Um, so a couple of drinks is okay, 
you know, killing a 30 pack on Friday night is not such a good idea. Similarly, eating ribs is okay, but taking down three racks by yourself in one weekend is not a good idea. So it's not terribly um, too far from common sense to say, well, if I have a little bit of animal protein, a little bit of veg-based protein, fruits, starches, dairy, I'm going to be okay. I'm talking allergy and, and medical conditions yeah. aside, if you're perfectly operating it gastrointestinal system, everything in moderation should be fine for you. Um, so this idea that I need to market my product as quote unquote better for you to get consumers to buy it is concerning for me when it comes to food because food should be nutritious, it should be affordable and it should be healthy um, for people. And that should that's kind of where the buck should stop with food. We shouldn't have to get into well, this protein is healthier for you than that protein. If we eat everything in moderation, we should be okay. So one of the things I've tried to talk to our portfolio companies about is please don't try to say that you are healthier than or that you are proven to be more sustainable in production than your animal protein counterpart because, and we could get into this in a second, but the, the animal protein industry is a disassembly business, right? I take an animal, I take it to a facility, I break it down into its component parts, and I sell those and I monetize those. Alternative proteins are an assembly business. I'm taking a variety of different ingredients. I have to put them all together. Those different ingredients typically come from different sources, which means multiple trucks, multiple diesel emissions, multiple uh, producers creating that ingredient, shipping it to your manufacturer, who's then sh shipping it to a cold storage facility, who's then shipping it to a distribution center, et cetera. So if I take just the one piece of the supply chain and say, well, I use soy, which uses less of the water than a cow, so there, ergo, I'm more sustainable than cow-based protein, I don't think is a fair assessment of the supply chain. Um, I think there's things we can do on both ends to make them both more sustainable, and maybe we can get plant-based there, but we're not there yet. Did I answer your questions? Um, so that's a great explanation for everybody because we do the same thing. We always go upstream of the source to see what the total cost and total impact is on everything 100%. we do. 100%. You have to. I mean, you can't. When we are at Tyson, 90% of our GHG footprint was attributed to us by our up and downstream partners. We only control 10%. So for Tyson to come out and say, we're going to reduce our GHG foot footprint 30% by 2030, and this was seven years ago. Um, and by the way, they're not close to that number. No one is. Um, you have to work up and downstream. I can't move. I mean, I got to see in calculus, I think like all accountants did, but I can't move something 30% when I only control 10%. Yeah. Right. I need to work with the other, other pieces of the supply chain. So. Uh, I have a, I have a, I have a comment and then, a, and then a question. So my comment is, I think we talked about sort of transitioning from protein to, to plant the reductitarian, like that, that phrase. Uh, I think also part of this is switching between proteins, right? So I'm sure, mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of folks are aware of this, right? I think it's um, six or seven kgs of, of feed to one kg of, of beef, right? So um, that's a huge factor for why the carbon footprint of beef is so high. Um, yeah. Chicken is like 1.6, right? So it's actually very super high conversion efficiency uh, from you know corn or soy into, into chicken. I think uh, uh, pork is somewhere in between closer so even just like switching from beef to chicken, I think is is a is a is a big one, um, as well. But um, my actually my question was your take on uh, anything fermentation based. I'm a chemical engineer slash biologist by by training, so I've done a ton of stuff over the years um, mm -hmm. in in the fermentation space, and I think um, the 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 kind of, kind of gold rush or whatever um, or boom in all these alternative proteins. Um, the last couple of years, I was pretty skeptical of because I think so much of the time it's like some some scientists that basically just, they're all doing the same thing. You're just engineering in this pathway into some kind of like microbe or doing some kind of like cell cellular culture, and it's kind of cute. Um, but at the end, of, and you can do a proof of concept that'll maybe get you a seed or a Series A, and then everyone faces the same reality that you need to put this in a fermentate fermenter. You need to do this at large scale. Particularly if it's cell culture, the the difficulty and the the double the the doubling time is so low, and I just feel like all of them are gonna like I just don't see anyone basically being successful in the fermentation scale up, or if folks are gonna be successful in the fermentation scale up, it's not gonna be the 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 professor in the lab that came up with some 
cute little like um, pathway engineering into a microbe. So um, I don't know. I, I It's hard for me to feel optimistic about where this space is going to go. And if there's going to be a winner, I think it's going to be very few out of a, out of a lot of uh, shots on goal. What, what's your take on that? Yeah, no, I, I, I think I would agree with you on that. Um, my, so having worked inside of Tyson and seeing how much food that company actually produces, and we were the, at the time I was there, we were the largest food company in the U.S., uh, producing something like 87 million pounds of prepared foods every week, processing about 39 million chickens every week and 400,000 hogs and 240 or 250,000 head of cattle. That was weekly. Those are weekly numbers. Same. Right. So so that just trying to give it's like when people say, well, you know, the, the economy is a trillion dollars. No one can really fathom how big a trillion dollars is. Right. Uh, but you can sort of get an idea of what 87 million pounds of Jimmy Dean breakfast sandwiches might look like. Um, so you, you're absolutely right. And my concern around fermentation has always been on the scale upside. And I'm so glad you brought up researchers and, and university folks because we work with them on our other fund. And, and we'll get into you know how we do that differently and deal with this issue around scale up, right? Just because we, just because you can do something in a lab doesn't mean you should try and do it at scale. Totally. Um, and on the fermentation side, and you'll if, if you all take a look at the portfolio, New Protein Fund One, and what we're doing in New Protein Fund Two, New Protein Fund One, six cohorts of companies. The first one, very consumer facing, because that's where the market was at the time. We weren't hyper competitive yet. We we're still trying things out. When we got to cohort four, you'll start to see a shift towards more upstream, enabling technologies for fermentation, enabling technologies for cultivated, because we realize the 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 un, the wealth isn't going to be created at the branded level. Brands are really really hard to get right. You have to you have to meet with brand authenticity. You have to meet the consumer at the exact right time and, and click with them, and then you're then you're spending marketing dollars basically. So let me move upstream and be the supplier. Of, of paradigm shifting ingredients, technology solutions, you know, can, can I find a technology that takes away the risk of, well, when I, what I can do in a one liter baby reactor is not, I can't, it's not a cupcake recipe, right? I just don't multiply by a hundred thousand and now I'm at a hundred thousand bio, liter bioreactor and it's going to come out exactly the same, right? The, you, you'll know this, right? The biophysics, what happens in that thing is not the same. Space makes it different. And if I'm trying to produce food at the same level that a Tyson is, I have to get it right. Because otherwise the bat, I'm gonna open the vat, the batch is gonna come out, it's gonna be ruined and I've lost everything, right? Um, so we spent a lot more time on the fermentation and even, and even on the cultivated side, on the ingredients, the technologies, as opposed to those consumer facing brands. Hey, I can make fermented cauliflower cheese. Well, that's great, but you can make you know one kilogram a week. So there are other fermentation use cases. For example, my company, the Ment I Mentor, uh, they convert um, carbon dioxide into methanol using microbes. It's some sort of fermentation. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's an early stage company. And I'm wondering some of your later cohort companies, where you in, uh, you know, kind of invested in the supporting infrastructure to scale, uh, might be also useful for these other use cases beyond food. Yeah. Um, so we have we have a company called Green On, which does something similar where we take carbon dioxide um, and convert it into oils, um, into a fat and oil ingredient. And AAK has actually co-invested uh, or directly co-invested in that company after they went through our accelerator. Um, so Green On is one that's pretty far along in that space. Um, certainly, again, leveraging fermentation technology as an unlock for something else, I think is really interesting. Um, but trying to leverage traditional fermentation technology to make cheeses or yogurts that are particularly plant-based, I think is going to be really difficult. Um, where are the where are the electrons slash hydrogen coming from when you're taking that CO2 to, to methane? Because it's either coming from, you're either having to feed a, a, a carbon, a, a sugar source for that metabolism, or it's photosynthesis. And if it's, a, and if it's, if you're having to feed media into that, then that's, there's no way that that's, yeah, sorry. Um, I the basic sort of energy balance on that on that fermentation. Um, could you elaborate on that? I can't, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can dig into it though, and I can get back to you on that. I just don't know off the top of my head. 
Yeah, I think um, um, for initial at least use cases, when it's not completely at scale, people are thinking of using the uh, excess electricity coming out of uh, windmills or solar panels uh, when they go in overproduction. So instead of shutting them down to electrolysis and generate hydrogen, but um, I'm still not sure how that can scale. Like if you're really wanting to produce so much oils or methanol uh, that can support like the whole transportation industry, uh, getting that much hydrogen is, I, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, Jesse, I, don't, I have I, a question. Listen. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah just have a question respect to the tech that you're seeing, which is being accepted and is, uh, let's say, receiving a good market feedback and is, is also scalable and also provide the nutrition. And where do you see the trend in the coming years? Where do you see the next five to 10 years? On the, on the plant-based protein side? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so definitely looking at not only taking down, so we've sort of solved for the cholesterol problem. And you have you have plant-based products that are cholesterol free. You have issues around texture. Right now we're leveraging mostly methyl cellulose to give it that sort of meaty mouthfeel. Um, that product is problematic. It leads to an extended ingredient panel, which we don't, which which the customers that we're trying to tell, and I saw someone put in the chat about this, highly processed foods. Um, I'm with you on that. Um, so the, the longer the ingredient panel is and the more things that are on there that I can't pronounce, let alone spell, I'm less likely to purchase that product, right? So that's an immediate turnoff for me. Um, a lot of these companies are leveraging things like palm oil, um, but we're trying to eliminate that in the supply chain and finding alternatives to that. Um, the other challenge we're having is frankly around the protein source. I mean, soy has been around for a very long time, but there's a growing amount of folks who are allergic to that. Um, soy and yellow pea are in the same family. So people who have soy allergies could be negatively affected by yellow pea protein. It's not always 100% certain. Um, the others, chickpea, fava, mung, um, even to some extent the myceliums, the, those crops aren't big enough. Um, and they're not big enough for two reasons. One, they're not big enough to, to re completely replace the supply chain of animal-based protein. And two, they're not big enough to create a financial hedge. You need to be able for to run these companies profitably. You need to be able to commoditize, you need to be able to be purchasing commoditized ingredients that give you a financial instrument to hedge against, you know, very strong movements in price, which for early stage companies can kill you. If you're if you're forced to buy market spot rate ingredients on a weekly, monthly basis, and, and you have a mal event, whether it's weather related, whether it is uh politically related you're gonna have a really hard time maintaining your cost of goods sold. And we saw that with Beyond Meat. One year over year, they went from a 22% gross margin to 0.2%, mainly because the price of yellow peas went through the roof. Um, so future, future, I'm seeing more focus on cleaner ingredient panels, uh, replacements for things like palm oil and coconut oil, uh, and replacement of methyl cellulose to improve the mouthfeel of the product. What's the problem with coconut oil? <laughs> uh, supply chain is challenging for these companies. It's expensive for them to acquire. So there might be um, some question about the kind of food, are they healthy or not? Uh, but I think uh, on the other side is uh, which country are easier to break into because the market is in need of this kind of alternative source of food. Which country is easier to break into? Gosh, I wish I, wish I knew the answer to that. It'd be easier to tell my companies where to go. Um, each market is different. Um, as I said, in the, US, uh, in the US, it's very price and taste focused. Um, and again, I, I, I think Sean had mentioned it around around chicken, chickens already, can, we tend to stay, we're, we're staying away from chicken alternative protein companies because nothing makes chicken meat cheaper than a chicken. Um, and it's already considered a healthier protein to your point. It, you know, when you say, whenever I say I'm going on a diet, I'm gonna eat grilled chicken and broccoli. That's my healthy diet. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not, so it, that, that one's a difficult one to get into. Um, 
I would say five would years say. ago, the U.S. would be a great market to get into because people were interested. It was a trend at that point. Now, unless you have a product that meets the incumbents on price, oh. and price it's really hard to break into that market. Um, Europe's in terminal demography. It's a shrinking population. So while they're more sustainably focused as consumers, it's a it's a shrinking population. Um, even China is is shrinking. Um, India now is the largest country in the world and will continue to be, but they're already traditionally plant based. So going there and selling them highly processed things to replace the minimally processed plant based things that they're already used to eating is going to be a very difficult. Uh, very difficult uh, proposition. And there's still a significant income gap in India. So you're selling to a smaller demographic that can afford these higher price products. So it's it's a challenge right now in that space. We're spending a lot more time on cultivated proteins um, than we are on plant-based and a lot more time on those enabling technologies for fermentation. So, uh, is it Middle East or Singapore uh, worth the efforts? <laughs> Everyone, um, I, I, we, we are grateful for Singapore's pioneering of approval of products in the market. The challenge there is it's a very small country. Uh -huh. uh, so, so to use Singapore as a market benchmark is really hard to do. Um, there's more people that live in, in New York City than live in Singapore. Um, so it's hard to say that you know, Singapore is approved. Israel is recently approved. That's a very great, that's a great step forward. Um as we start to move westward across the continents. Um, Europe is still still tough to say. They're very GMO, very negative on GMOs. There's a lot of discussion around, uh, and we could spend an hour and 15 on, on whether cultivated protein is GMO or not. I don't mean to open up a can of worms on that, but Europe is going to be a difficult market. Italy has already banned cultivated proteins. Um, we think the Netherlands will be one of the first to approve and allow it to be sold. The Dutch seem to be fairly forward thinking that way. Um, and in the U.S., we have a couple of companies who've received um, no comment letters from FDA um, and USDA on the product, but they've yet to build scaled production facilities because cost is still an issue. Mm -hmm. um, Tom, do you still have time to cover the, the, the other phone? Yes. That will yeah. create community jobs. I think that has a very meaningful purpose. Yeah, no, and, and I appreciate all the questions around alternative proteins. Please feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, my my email and Calendly is in my LinkedIn, so feel free to just jump in there and shoot me. A, I think my phone number is in there too. Um, I'm happy to talk about it all day long. But yeah, Jesse, thank you. Um, so we did launch another fund here at the firm. We call it the Generation Food Rural Partners Fund, or GFRP, uh, as I'll as I'll call it throughout this to to save some time. Um, this fund is very different than the new protein fund strategy. This fund uh, works the supply chain of solving problems for food and agriculture companies. So we will talk to the Nestle's of the world, we'll talk to Unilever, all the way down to a small stakeholder farmer here in the States and in Europe. And we've built a, a basically a data lake of problems that these folks are trying to solve, whether it's around single-use plastics, uh, scaffolding for cultivated proteins, replacement for petroleum-based adhesives, we, we map sort of the, the universe of problems as well as we can. And then we work back to a pool of university developed research and IP. And the goal here is to start around 20 to 40, depending on how big the fund gets, but 20 to 40 new companies based on baskets of university IP. So not one patent, but multiple patents, uh, coupled with experienced management teams to build companies to solve some of these problems. Um, that these companies are trying to face, which are the reasons why none of them are going to hit their GHG reduction goals um, in time. Um, this fund is also a licensed RBIC fund. Um, RBIC stands for Rural Business Investment Company. It's a license issued by the USDA, very similar to SBIC funds, if you're familiar with those. Um, it's a license that allows banks to invest in our fund. Any other LP can invest in our fund. Typically, banks cannot invest in private funds. Uh, due to the Volcker rule, um, but SBIC licenses and RBIC licenses are exemptions to that. So we launched our fund with 10 farm credit banks. So if you're a farmer in the U.S., you bank at farm credit, your mortgage is with them, your tractor leases are with them, et cetera. They have a mandate to drive economic growth and development in rural communities. 
And they do that with us by committing LP capital to our fund. And we spin up new companies, as I said, to solve these supply chain problems. And we put our new companies and the living wage jobs we create in rural communities to drive that economic growth and development. Um, our areas of focus are food, protein, and agriculture. We're purposely broad. Um, we've yet to do it in an actual, I would say, an actual food investment <laughs> um, to date. We've done um, two deals in, in the material science space. Uh, and again, we're trying to deal with the entire supply chain of food and agriculture, not just food products. You'll probably not see a chicken nugget or a burger come out of this fund, but you'll see things like bio-based adhesives. You'll see things like sustainable starch-based packaging, uh, dissolvable films for, uh, for dry powder delivery of, of ingredients and mixes. Uh, and we're working right now on an endophytic microbe investment uh, to solve for some of the synthetic crop enhancements and soil enhancement products. We're trying to replace those with more bio-based, um, which are microbe produced. So I'm going to stop I, there. So Thomas, you mentioned the plant-based protein. There are only a couple that have scale <clears throat> and garbanzo beans and other proteins are, are not big enough in terms of scale. Do you have any initiative to get them to scales? I mean, instead of really focusing on uh, animal-based protein, uh, why not accelerate uh, the plant-based proteins as well as a strategy? Are you, are you you're talking back to the new protein fund strategy? Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's we, we've thought about a couple of ways to do that. You have to incentivize growers to plant the crop so that you can grow a large enough harvest to create a commoditized marketplace. Um, and, we, and then we've gone and talked to financial services companies and say, well, how can we create a commodities exchange for mung bean? And how can we create a commodities exchange for chickpea? Um, and to pardon the pun, but there's just not an appetite um, at the big banks to do that right now because there's, there's just too much underwriting risk that they'd have to take. So... Um, I mean, we, we're now with, with this new fund, the Rural Partners Fund that we're talking about and our relationship with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, we can start to have some of those conversations with them and say, well, you know, here's what we're seeing on the alternative protein side. If you're really interested in driving that kind of movement in the in the U.S. market, USDA has to get involved. There may need to be some, some adjustment of farm subsidies. Uh, maybe we can work something into the next farm bill, um, not this one, but on the next cycle. Uh, to see about getting farmers to dedicate parts of parcels of land to growing these alternative protein crops. But without the crop, I can't create a market for it. Do they have any such things in India? I mean, per perhaps there's not enough volume in the U.S., but in India it's possible. It, it may be possible, but then you have the transportation issue. So you got to bring it from India over to the US, which is typically over the ocean, which means bunker fuel, high emissions, expensive supply chain, and now you've lost your price competition. So for the third fund that you just introduced, I see there's a key point that it is with the end in mind and backward to start the investment and incubation. So does that mean uh, you already have the nails. It's not like you have the hammer first and you find the nail, like find the market or product market fit. So yeah, yeah it, so it works. Both, it can work both ways. Um, we've we've seen interesting pools of intellectual property. Um, like our team knows that packaging is an issue for the entire consumer goods market. We don't need Nestle to tell us that that plastic is an issue. Um, but when we saw some interesting technology and research around, for instance, endophytic microbes, then we started digging around on the market side and asking the Cortevas and the and folks like that, are, you know, if we can build a company that can achieve X, Y, Z, is that interesting to you? And will you work with us on commercializing that and pulling that research and, and you know, TRL 7, 8 forward to a full product? And they say yes, then we get excited about that. Um, and then our fund, um, our fund will deploy capital to spin up the new company, license the intellectual property from the university, hire the management team, do techno-economic risk assessment. And if it passes all of those KPIs, the fund then invests another tranche of capital 
to get it to sort of first product. And then at that point, the fund, along with the management team that's in place, we go out and we hire, we we raise outside capital um, from traditional VCs because now we've we've built the company, we've built the management team, we've de-risked the technology, we have production in place, we've sort of ticked all the boxes, all the reasons I say no to deals in the other fund, I've now ticked off there off the no list, uh, and the goal is to bring these companies to market and start raising outside capital for them. Yeah. Yeah. Because at first you already identified the market demand there. We've already identified there's a customer need there. Like we know 3M needs to replace petroleum-based adhesives. We know that Hudamaki needs to replace resin-based packaging. Um, we know that you know, Nestle would love to move from aluminum and paper uh, satchels of cocoa mix to a dissolvable film that's edible and, and grass, generally regarded as safe or, or grass as we call it where I can just drop this pod into my cup of hot water, stir it around, minimize the packaging, reduce the shipping cost and weight, um, and be able to achieve their sustainable goals. We know they they want that. So does that mean those companies that you pick, they will have the chance to pilot the product? Absolutely. The, yeah. the corporate yeah, we, we identify a, what we call a commercialization pull-through partner for every investment. Okay. We identify them before we approve. Yeah. Thank you. That's interesting. Any question from others? No, thank you, Thomas. That's very informative. I appreciate y'all's time. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, just look me up, shoot me a note. Happy to talk about anything. Um, yeah. Food. Mm -hmm. It's been a while since I did software um <laughs> but happy to happy to chat yeah um i can share a uh, tom's side tech with you all or, or even in in the next newsletter and uh, um Pero, uh has a few dash platform i think uh we'd like to i really like to try like use this platform to like structure make this engagement process more efficient. So uh, yeah, please uh, try. I already sent the, the link to you. <laughs> so, and then we can, yeah, discuss this uh, in email or next time meeting. That'd be great. Thank you, Jesse. Appreciate you setting this up for us. Thanks everyone. Enjoy your weekends. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Jesse. Bye. Thanks, Jonas. I'll take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.